Lesson 5, The History of Afghanistan. So today we're going to talk about the Soviet invasion and the rise of the Taliban. And this is really where we get the, the stage set then for American involvement. Um, so we're going to talk basically 1973 to 2001. Um, we all know what happened in 2001. That was 9-11. And that was the beginning of, this, of American military intervention. Um, 1973 was the, uh, was the fall of the last uh, king or emir of Afghanistan, the last of the Durrani line that started all the way back right when we started. We started talking about Ahmad Shah Durrani, the last of his you know, descendants or clan or tribal group uh, ended in 1973. So uh, we're talking today, this is all Soviet Union this, these countries, the Kazakhstan and all that, didn't exist. And of course, we got Pakistan here with the Duran line. Um, and of course, you've got Afghanistan right there in the middle between Pakistan, which was an ally with the US, and uh, the Soviet Union. So last time, um, I tried to trace out three different uh, themes from the first half of the, or the first two thirds of the 20th century a couple of things, the factors that developed that were influential in what happened. Uh, the first was a conflict that started to develop between conservative Islam on the one hand and the monarchy which wanted to westernize and modernize the country. Uh, they got this idea that they didn't just want to rule a bunch of, you know, beggars who were, <laughs> who were just infighting, so they wanted to modernize the country and turn it into a real nation. So, but they started having this conflict. And that came to a head under the one king called Amin Allah Khan, who tried to institute a lot of social reforms and ended up getting kicked out for his troubles. So that was part of the, what's called the Young Afghan Movement, which we talked a bunch about last time. That, after that debacle with Amin Allah, they kind of got discredited. Uh, but the, uh, the Communist Party kind of took up that mantle of social change that the, that the young Afghans kind of left. So we're going to kind of pick up with that conflict today. Um, secondly, economic failure, um, which I believe was due to a top-down debt-based policies by the government. Basically, Afghanistan didn't have much of an economy, so the government set out to try to borrow money to create an economy. And... Uh, they never really got the, the idea, the capitalistic idea that wealth has to come from the bottom up. Um, they tried to just borrow the money and build it and then control it with the state so that they could get the money, and it just didn't work. So, yeah, one of the things that's interesting is they tried to go from straight from pretty much no economy to socialism. You know, oftentimes socialism gets to ride on cat on the wealth produced by capitalism for a while. Um, but it, it didn't take long at all when you go straight to socialism. It doesn't take long at all for things to fall apart. Finally, the last factor that I tried to trace out was the breakdown of relationship with Pakistan over the Pashtunistan issue, uh, which if you remember, when the British left, they created the country of Pakistan. But with the British power out of it, um, this, they resurrected the issue of what was going to happen to the Pashtun population on that, on Pakistan's side of the Duran line. And uh, Afghanistan wanted to create another country called Pashtunistan so that, um, you know, the Pashtuns could have a homeland. But uh, really it was part of a bigger conflict with Pakistan. But anyway, relations completely broke down. And uh, so these, these uh, factors had then a couple results. One was rural Afghanistan remained technologically primitive and religiously conservative while the cities became much more developed and secular. So the cities was of course where the monarchy was investing all the money. So they became more developed and also they brought in a lot of foreign workers and that kind of thing which ended up making everything more more diverse and more secular while the rural communities remained pretty much untouched just how they had been. Um, and so then there became this tension between what the rural communities wanted and what the cities wanted. Then Afghanistan became militarily and economically dependent on the Soviet Union. Because of the fallout with Pakistan, 
Um, eventually, that fallout became so bad, as we saw, that the border was completely closed for four years. So nothing could go through. So all the goods had to go north to the Soviet Union. And uh, that made them economically dependent. And then because the United States, who was the other you know, main world power, had a strong alliance with Pakistan, the only way Afghanistan could get aid was from the Soviet Union, from a military standpoint. America wasn't going to arm an enemy you know, to one of its allies. So all those factors kind of started tipping the Afghanistan into the Soviet camp. And then one of the results of that was that Afghanistan became uh, disproportionately communist in its military because all of its military was getting trained by the Soviets. Um, the military became very much, very closely aligned with the Communist Party. Um, and uh, we'll see the results of that in a minute. Uh, before we get into the political situation, I just want to talk about one uh, infrastructure project that the Soviets did. And this is one of many. The Soviets, we talked a little bit last time about the Helmand River project and the American and foreign aid. Um, the Soviet aid made the American aid look like nothing. It was just the Soviets invested huge amounts into Afghanistan in the 50s and 60s in an effort to just kind of bring them more into the Soviet sphere of influence. So one of the things that they did was they constructed the Salang Highway, which is, it was the first all-weather road from mazar -e sharif to Kabul, linking those. And you see, you have to go through the Hindu Kush mountain range to do that. And to, so to build that road, they built a tunnel through the mountains there, through the Salang Pass, and at its time, it was, the, it was the longest tunnel in the world and the highest in elevation. It was over, it was like a mile and a half long uh, tunnel. And it was, a, it was a, a technological marvel at the time that they were able to pull it off. But what it did was, it gave a road from the Soviet Union to Kabul, is what the result was. And uh, some historians have pointed out that the road was much bigger than Afghanistan needed at the time. But it was perfect for Soviet heavy tanks and stuff like that know, a decade later. So uh, the Soviets, in their aid, definitely prepared their way for a military intervention. Yes? Do you think they realized at the time? Probably to a certain extent. But um, what, what choice did they have? You know, they were, the, the, the monarchy always, um, since the British always relied on foreign money to keep themselves in power. And this was just the last installment of that. And uh, so anyway, um, Kabul University, uh, to pick up with some of the social situation here, Kabul University became a focal point for some unrest. And two factions developed there in the among the students and the teachers and a lot of all the, like the intellectual elite. Um, on the one hand, you had military students that were largely trained by Soviet teachers and made trips to the USSR for training. And many of these joined the PDPA, which is the Communist Party of Afghanistan. It stands for People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, I think. Anyway, so a huge disproportionate amount of the army became part of this Communist Party. Uh, religious students, on the other hand, formed Islamic activist groups, and many of them also studied in Egypt and came back as converts to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is all, a, a, you know, a radical, um, nationalistic, they want, uh, a movement that wants to create Muslim nation states, essentially. Um, two of the two guys that are prominent parts of this uh, student movement were Gobaldin Hekmatyar and Ahmed Shah Massoud. And those two guys we're going to see later, became the two prominent guerrilla leaders against the Soviets. Um, but at this point, uh, in the 60s, they, are, uh, they were just part of a student movement against the monarchy. Um, so in, in uh, 1973 then, the king, Zaire Shah, made a sudden trip to Italy, uh, ostensibly for eye surgery. Um, a lot of people think that he was given a tip that he needed to get out of the country. But uh, a guy named uh, Daoud uh, seized power. His, uh, he was a former president. He had been, uh, he had been involved 
a lot in the breakdown of relations with Pakistan. And because of the, his bungling that, he got kicked out as the president. They put a new guy in. He kind of went away mad and formed an alliance with the Communist Party and the military. And uh, in 1973, he managed to do a coup and seize power. It was mostly a bloodless affair since pretty much all the military was on his side. So, um, but he, he kind of disappointed the Communist Party because it turned out that he had no intention of being controlled by anybody. So he used the Communist Party to get rid of all the Islamic hardliners in the government. And then he started to slowly get, you know, get the communist guys out too. So in trying to build a strong government that was more loyal to him. Um, he also began to pull away from the USSR, started turning down some aid, and just uh, in general pulling away a little bit. And the Soviets, you know, started started to sense that. So uh, that brings us to a guy named Taraki and the Sour Revolution. So by early, about a year later, or no, sorry, four years later, um, by early 1978, the Soviet government was convinced that Daoud's government was not in the USSR's best interests. Um, the Communist Party, the PDPA, was also unhappy with him. So on April 27th, with a nod from the KJB, the, the KJB was by this time operating in conjunction with the PDPA to plan these these uprisings. So with a nod from the KGB, the PDPA um, and the military took over the government again. Uh, Daoud and his family and a couple thousand palace guards were killed in a, in a firefight in the palace. So President Taraki became Afghanistan's first communist ruler. So he started uh, introducing some Marxist reforms. Um, so uh, one of the, some of the things he did, the first thing he had to do was to break down some of the social structures, um, the traditional social structures of Afghanistan so that he could reconfigure things along Marxist lines. So some of the things he did was outlaw polygamy, dowries, interest on loans, and he canceled all debts older than five years. So you can see how he's trying to get rid of the, this is an attack on the feudal system that Afghanistan operated under where you had wealthy landholders and then a lot of peasants that just kind of worked for them. And so this was an attack on that. If you, you know, some of these reforms, like polygamy, these were some of the very things that had gotten Amin Ali Khan kicked out, you know, 40 years earlier. So, um, you know, they, were, they didn't read their history. But anyway, uh, another thing he did was he began aggressively redistributing land from wealthy landholders to peasants and nomads. So this idea, you know, we have the class warfare, so we're going to take from the rich landholders and, you know, spread out the wealth to the peasants. Well, so this had some, those are just a few of the things that he did. Many, many other reforms. So one of the problems was, though, that people in Afghanistan thought of themselves in terms of family and ethnic groups, not in terms of class warfare. This is not the kind of situation that Marxism was intended to deal with. That's my understanding. He outlawed interest entirely. No. And, and, that, and the result was that wealthy people stopped giving loans. But the, you know, in a, in a Marxist economy, I guess you don't really need loans because the government takes care of everything, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea of class warfare, that was, they, they, that idea was come up with in for you know highly developed economies, and it that just was not the case in, in Afghanistan, and they should have you know recognized that, but you know they were just you know trying to implement the vision of, of Marxism blindly, and uh, one of the repercussions of that was that wealthy individuals stopped lending money. So the result of that was that peasants found themselves without the capital to farm their newly acquired land. So you're a peasant, you don't. The reason you're a peasant is because you don't have anything, right? So you're plopped in this land, and now you have no way to produce because no one will give you any capital. Um, another effect was the peasants uh, traditionally borrowed money for lavish weddings and funerals. And they suddenly found themselves you know, embarrassed by being able, unable to live up to these social expectations 
because they didn't have any money. Um, so then this, the, the, the government set up these cooperatives, of course. Um, but the cooperatives proved out, proved to be uh, completely inept in dealing with you know, issues like water rights that have been traditionally taken care of by powerful landholders and um, those things had been sorted. They had a system for sorting those things out and that wasn't there. Everyone started fighting over water and the result was that no one got any water, pretty much. So the, re the end result was that the very people that, you know, this was supposed to be helping, the, the peasants, um, were some of the people that ended up fighting the hardest against it. Um, so within, within months of, the, of this glorious sour revolution um, of communism, revolt broke out all over the country. Um, exiled, uh, one of the things they had done right away was exile those uh, Islamic intellectuals like uh, Hekmatyar that we talked about and and uh, so they, they announced, they set up bases in Peshawar, which is in Pakistan, just over the Khyber Pass, and uh, announced a jihad against the communists. Uh, Pakistan, so Pakistan, their worst nightmare is to have a communist Afghanistan at their back while they're trying to have this war with India. So what they really wanted was a, was a good Islamic ally to their back. So they happily welcomed the... Uh, the guys to set up bases in Peshawar, started giving them equipment, started training their guys. Um, they were more than happy to support the, uh, the Mujahideen is what they're called. Um, you may have heard that term, um, but basically that means those who conduct jihad. So um, the, guy, the guerrilla fighters against the communists came to be called the Mujahideen in, in the discussions and the history that goes around this. So, um, Taraki's presidency was going south in a hurry. A lot of the Communist Party became disillusioned with his reforms. Um, so, as the political situation deteriorated, a guy named Hafizala Amin uh, took over the government in yet another military coup. This is about a year later. The military switched their support, and President Amin came to power. And he started to back off from some of those reforms. He realized just wasn't going to work to go so fast. And he also started to pull a little bit away from the Soviet Union and try to re, um, renegotiate some terms with Pakistan and even the United States he reached out to. So much so that the Soviets, the KGB, even speculated that he was in the pay of the CIA. Um, they, because it just he, w he wasn't towing the Soviet, the Soviet line. So uh, the, the result was that nobody was happy, though. The Soviet Union didn't like him. The Islamists didn't like him because it was too little too late. And by the end of uh, 1979, 70% of the country was outside of the government's control. It was just in revolt. So on December 12, 1979, Brezhnev, who the, was the communist, the Soviet leader at that time, gave the order to intervene militarily uh, in Afghanistan. And the plan was to assassinate Amin and install a new president who would do what he was told, basically. And they had this guy named uh, Bob Rock Carmel, who claimed that he had a lot of popular support in Afghanistan. And so they decided to go in and install him as the new uh, president, and hopefully you know, beef him up militarily, and hopefully that would solve this problem. So Soviet invasion. So a few days later, um, Hundreds of KJB special force, KGB special forces landed at Kabul airport. On Christmas morning, the KJB um, secured the airport, and those big Soviet cargo planes started landing and dropping off troops and equipment. Meanwhile, several assassination plots had failed. The idea had been to assassinate the president, Amin, and bring the other guy in and try to make it look like it was a, you know, a legitimate transfer of power. Uh, that didn't really, that kind of fell apart when they, they just weren't able to kill him. And so finally, two days after they started landing troops, um, the KGB stormed the palace and killed Amin and uh, about 150 other people who happened to be there. Uh, in the north, uh, up at the, at the Amu Darya, the main Soviet force crossed the river on some pontoon bridges that they set up and uh, headed down the Salang Highway toward Kabul. So within a few weeks, they had overrun every major, every major 
place in Afghanistan. It didn't. It wasn't hard. Um, and that began the Soviet occupation. So like the British, the Soviets soon found that conquering Afghanistan was one thing, ruling it and administrating it was another. The Mujahideen were now aided by Pakistan, America, and Saudi Arabia, and they refused to accept defeat. It soon became evident that the new president, Bob Rock Carmel's supposed popularity, was a myth, and his army of conscripts had little loyalty or interest in fighting. And the result was that the Red Army was tied down, propping up this new administration. If you, if you remember to when we talked about the first Anglo-Afghan War, this, the parallels between this and that are striking. The, the British had uh, attempted to put a guy named Shuja back on the throne, who was supposedly very popular, and uh, ended up not being. And as a result, the British were tied up for years trying to prop him up and eventually withdrew, you know, they wouldn't say in disgrace, but they didn't get what they wanted. Um, so that, that very quickly became the same situation that the Soviets were in. Um, this is kind of where America comes into the, to the picture in a, in a bigger way. So early in 1980, so the Soviet intervention was in basically in 1979. Um, by early 1980, Carter had approved 20 million in assistance to the Mujahideen. And in the years following Reagan's election in 1981, the number exploded to 630 million a year. This amount was doubled dollar for dollar by a matching agreement with Saudi Arabia. Um, so, you know, well over a billion dollars in foreign uh, money coming to these uh, guerrilla fighters. So this, this money was funneled through the CIA to Pakistan's ISI. ISI is Pakistan's spy agency. Um, so this was supposed to be very secret. It's pretty, it's pretty much certain within a few years that the, the Soviets knew what was going on, but they couldn't really do anything about it. Uh, ISI then built training camps, purchased weapons, and chose which commanders to aid. From the beginning, the hardline Islamist Hekmatyar was a favorite. Um, Pakistan viewed him as an ideal future leader, um, while the CIA, for their part, the only thing they cared about was that he was killing Soviets. The, the only American motivation in this conflict was to tie down the Soviet Union and cost them as much blood and money as possible. Um, and the program was, was pretty effective. So um, there was some differences among the guerrilla fighters. Um, the one guy we talked about, we're going to talk about it more in a minute, Masud, he was uh, slightly more temperate in his outlook. Um, Hekmatyar was by far the most radical Islamist leader. Um, he's the kind of guy that, you know, if you didn't do, didn't, didn't pray however many times a day, he would you know, come and beat you up at night or throw acid in your face. That kind of guy. So, um, as the jihad drug on into the mid-80s, religious warriors from all over the Middle East and from Africa began to pour into Pakistani training camps where they learned the techniques of sabotage, ambush, and guerrilla warfare. So soon all, all kinds of guys, anyone who wanted to you know, fight for Islam, started coming into these camps you know, and being funneled into Afghanistan. Um, and, and they started learning this stuff, like how to do sabotage and ambush and stuff that we now call terrorism. Um, Few American officials considered the side effects that training these fighters might have. At one point, the CIA even printed and distributed copies of the Quran to stir up resistance in less Islamic areas. Can you believe it? Um, from the Cold War standpoint, Islamic Jihad was America's best friend. These were the guys that were the best fighters against communism, the most dedicated. Um, and according to Western you know, propaganda, these were not fanatics trying to set up Sharia law. These were freedom fighters. Um, but, you know, if you want to look at what they actually believed, what they wanted to do was set up a hardline Islamic state in Afghanistan. So that's kind of a, uh, from an American standpoint. From Pakistan's standpoint, um, this, was a, this was like a bonanza. They were just getting 
all this money funneled straight into their government and they could spend it how, you know, to promote what they wanted. So Pakistan used the huge influx of funds for basically two purposes. One, to establish a conservative Sunni Islamic ally in Afghanistan. And two, to train fighters for its continued jihad against India. So from the very beginning, these camps were not just used for Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan was siphoning guys off of them to take to their other border to stir up trouble with India. Then on top of that, as millions of refugees fled the fighting in Afghanistan, these huge refugee camps developed in Pakistan. And so the Pakistani government took full advantage of that to set up schools and promote jihad. Basically, a whole generation of young men of Afghanistan were, were trained in these schools, and the Pakistani government had every reason to want to instill in them the idea of jihad. As far as the conflict inside Afghanistan goes, I don't have time to talk a lot about it, but I want to talk about this one guy, Ahmed Shah Massoud. Um, Massoud was one of these Mujahideen commanders, and he was a fiercely independent Tajik uh, based in the Panjshir Valley. Now, this is the Panjshir Valley right here. Uh, Kabul is right down here, um, so it's a little bit north and to the east. Notice the uh, position of here. This is the Salang Highway right going up through here. The, it goes right by the base of the Panjshir Valley. And so it was a very strategic location. Um, so um, from Pakistan's point of view, because he was Tajik instead of Pushtun and preferred to operate in the Panjshir Valley instead of setting up a base in Peshawar, he was almost entirely cut off by Pakistan. Uh, received very little amounts of money in arms. Um, Pakistan viewed him rather as a threat to its vision of a future Afghanistan dominated by its relationship with Pakistan. So they wanted somebody that they could control and that would be you know, a, a good uh, Pushtun leader to replace the Durrani monarchy. And Massoud just didn't fit that bill. But despite this, cobbling together an army uh, from captured equipment and funds from opium exports, he proved to be a military genius and the most effective Mujahideen commander of the war. Um, it's just, you can't help but, he wasn't necessarily a good guy, but you can't help but admire him when you read the accounts of his, of his war. Um, with what he was able, the, the losses that he was able to inflict based on the little amounts of stuff that he had is, is unbelievable. Um, the proximity of the Panjshir Valley to the Salang Highway allowed Massoud to prey on Soviet supply lines and made him a key target. With very little outside aid, he managed to fight back nine major Soviet offensives. And we're talking big offensives, you know, helicopters, tanks, everything that they could throw at him, and he fought them to a standstill. They were never able to subdue the Panjshir Valley. He also showed remarkable governing abilities by developing systems for farmers to do their work at night and then retreat to the mountains by day. Um, he was the only Mujahideen commander to negotiate a ceasefire with the Soviets, allowing the population and fighters much needed time to recuperate. Um, he just he proved to be one of the one of the more able leaders of the of the war. Well. By 1988-89, there was just no victory in sight for the Soviets. Um, the, the foreign money, as the, as the situation bogged down more, foreign governments like the USA and, the, and Saudi Arabia just kept, just, kept, they just kept piling on more money. This was great, you know. This was what they wanted. So the Soviet troops finally withdrew, um, leaving the communist government to fend for itself. In all, the Soviets lost around 14,000 killed and 50,000 wounded. At its height, the war cost the USSR 20% of its gross national product. Massive expenditure. Um, in Afghanistan, it left an estimated million dead. Those, wouldn't, those would be not just people who died from famine, who died in the fighting, whatever. A lot of things led to people dying. Um, Many more were maimed for life by anti-personnel mines. The Soviets, they're still today. It's very dangerous to travel in certain parts of Afghanistan because of all the unexploded mines. 
It had displaced many millions of civilians and created a whole generation of angry young men who grew up in refugee camps with very little social restraint. Just a social disaster. Yeah. So their, uh, their Afghanistan was worse than Vietnam. What do you mean? In terms of total casualties. Yeah, I don't, what, are, what were the casualties? Total casualties in Vietnam were 50,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's killed, that's killed, wounded, mm -hmm. missing. That's both sides. No, that's just, that's just U.S. So the Soviets lost 50,000, 50, wounded. 50. Yeah, so between 60 and 70,000. Yeah, it looks like about the same amount of time, too. Yeah. Total, according to one guy I read, a total of 600,000 Soviets served in Afghanistan through the rotation throughout yeah. the war. Huge amount. Un really, really amazing. <laughs> um, well, you can imagine chaos ensued when the, when the Soviets left. Without the Soviet support, the communist government soon collapsed. Um, the UN tried to... Uh, establish a coalition government of Mujahideen commanders, but it collapsed when Hekmatyar refused to sign the agreement. So the good, well-meaning UN tried to put together a political solution, but it didn't work. Um, for, while publicly supporting a coalition, Pakistan covertly supported Hekmatyar as he fought other commanders and made a drive for Kabul. So, you know, anyone who was anybody was now trying to get to Kabul to be the next government. Uh, Masud had signed on to the, the coalition agreement, uh, which, which part of the agreement was nobody's supposed to go to Kabul. Um, but seeing Hekmatyar's intentions, he occupied Kabul just the day before Hekmatyar arrived. So Hekmatyar responded by launching hundreds of rockets on Kabul, leveling large parts of the city and killing thousands of civilians. This was a bad time to be in Kabul. Um, but despite being far better equipped, Hekmat Yar repeatedly failed to dislodge Masud. He, he was not the military mind and just couldn't do it, even though he had the whole weight of Pakistan behind him. Uh, by 19, so the, the Soviets left in 89. So by 1994, the country had disintegrated into a patchwork of areas controlled by local warlords, each levying his own taxes and tolls and enforcing his own views of justice. So it just became anarchy, basically. Um, everybody who had a couple hundred fighters under his command could set up his own little kingdom. And if you tried to, you couldn't travel through the country because you had to pay tolls every, you know, couple miles um, to, to a different warlord. Um, so with that, um, with Hekmat Yar's repeated failures, Pakistan began to look for a new Pashtun faction to support. And what they came up with was this little group called the Taliban. So um, the Taliban was a small group of former Mujahideen in the south, led by an obscure guy named Mullah Omar. Raise your hand if you've heard of Mullah Omar. Two of us. Okay, he's uh, thought to be dead now. I don't know if it's, con yeah, I think it is confirmed. But uh, anyway, unlike, unlike Hekmatyar and Masud, Mullah Omar and his group had no secular education, so they hadn't gone to Kabul University. Um, instead, they were mainly sons of poor farmers and refugees, uh, their only training being in, these, in local Islamic schools. So they were disappointed by the corruption and infighting of the Mujahideen, and they set, up, set out to create a new Afghanistan ruled by God's law and his servants, the Taliban. Now the Taliban comes from a word Talib, which means student. So these guys, they were, they promoted themselves and gave themselves the image of being you know, students of the Quran um, and a, a, you know, a purist Islamic movement, as opposed in opposition to the rampant corruption of you know, all these other fighters were, were supposedly trying to set up an Islamic state, but, but they were very corrupt. So uh, Taliban takeover, after securing an agreement with the Taliban to open trade routes, Pakistan began to divert huge amounts of equipment and money from Hekmat Yar to the Taliban. As the Taliban created an image of religious purity, thousands of disillusioned young men signed up as volunteers. And by late 1996, they had taken Kabul, and by 1998, only Masud offered serious resistance to the Taliban. 
Um, even even Masud had been driven all the way back to the Panjshir Valley and was fighting for his life against you know, waves of Taliban uh, fighters. And so this is this at, at by 2001. This is the political situation in Afghanistan. Uh, this whole area controlled by the Taliban. Just a little corner up here controlled by Masud. And uh, also, you know, over this time, uh, as soon as the Soviets pulled out, American aid was cut pretty much to nothing. Uh, basically, America said, you know, the Soviets are gone. Um, you know, we don't, don't really care what happens now. So um, pretty much America walked away. A lot of American officials were uh, very upset about that and wanted to support Masud against the Taliban. And they viewed, they viewed Masud as, as a political solution. Other people said, no, we have to have a Pashtun solution. And um, those people favored just legitimizing the Taliban. And they, and they hoped, those officials hoped on their end that the Taliban would cool off over time and turn into a, more of a, an Islamic state that was more friendly to the West. But uh, anyway, that's where we're going to cut it off today. That basically brings us up to 2001. Any questions?